As uh, World War I, the war to end all wars, was drawing to a close, an American soldier sat down at a piano and composed a song. It was designed to be part of a musical review for his army camp out on Long Island, Suffolk County. The song was God Bless America. The composer, of course, was Irving Berlin, who came here at the age of five, son of immigrants who came to this country for freedom. As composers are wont to do, Berlin worked very carefully with the lyrics. The song needed to be pure. It needed to be above politics, about partisanship. He intended it to be a song for all America, but he intended it to be more than just a song. It was to be a prayer for the country. As your very distinguished chaplain, Admiral Barry Black, has done in his prayers on these long days that you've spent as judges in the high court of impeachment, we've been reminded of what our country is all about and that it stands for one nation, under God. Nation is about freedom. And we hear the voice of Martin Luther King Jr. and his dream-filled speech about freedom, echoing the great passages inscribed on America's Temple of Justice, the Lincoln Memorial, which stood behind Dr. King as he spoke on that historic day. Dr. King is gone, felled by an assassin's bullet, but his words remain with us. And during his magnificent life, Dr. King spoke not only about freedom, freedom standing alone. He spoke frequently about freedom and justice. And in his speeches, he summed up regularly the words of a Unitarian abolitionist from the prior century, Theodore Parker, who referred to the moral arc of the universe, the long moral arc of the universe, points toward justice, freedom and justice. Freedom whose contours have been shaped over the centuries in the English-speaking world by what Justice Benjamin Cardozo called the authentic forms of justice through which the community expresses itself in law. Authentic. Authenticity. And at the foundation of those authentic forms of justice is fundamental fairness. It's playing by the rules. It's why we don't allow deflated footballs or stealing signs from the field. Rules are rules. They are to be followed. And so I submit that a key question to be asked as you begin your deliberations, were the rules here faithfully followed? If not, if that is your judgment, then with all due respect, the prosecutors should not be rewarded, just as federal prosecutors are not rewarded. You didn't follow the rules. You should have. As a young lawyer, I was blessed to work with one of the great trial lawyers of his time. And I asked him, Dit, what's your secret? He had just defended successfully a former United States senator who was charged with a serious offense, perjury, before a federal grand jury. His response was simple and forthright. His words could have come from prairie lawyer Abe Lincoln. I let the judge and the jury know that they can believe and trust every word that comes out of my mouth. I will not be proven wrong. And so here's a question as you begin your deliberations. Have the facts as presented to you as a court, as the high court of impeachment, proven trustworthy? Has there been full and fair disclosure in the course of these proceedings? Fundamental fairness. I recall these words from the podium last week, a point would be made by one of the president's lawyers, and then this would follow. The house managers didn't tell you that. Why not? And again, the house managers didn't tell you that. Why not? At the Justice Department on the fifth floor of the Robert F. Kennedy building is this simple inscription. The United States wins its point when justice is done its citizens in the courts. Not did we win, not did we convict, rather the moral question was justice done. Of course, as has been said frequently, the House of Representatives does, under our Constitution, enjoy the sole power of impeachment. No one has disputed that fact. They've got the power, but that doesn't mean that anything goes. It doesn't mean that the House cannot be called to account 
and the High Court of Impeachment for its actions in exercising that power. A question to be asked, are we to countenance violations of the rules and traditional procedures that have been followed scrupulously in prior impeachment proceedings? And the Judiciary Committee, the venerable Judiciary Committee of the House of Representatives, compare and contrast the thoroughness of that committee in the age of Nixon its thoroughness in the age of Clinton with all of its divisiveness within the committee in this proceeding. A question to be asked. Did the House Judiciary Committee rush to judgment in fashioning the articles of impeachment? Did it carefully gather the facts, assess the facts, before it concluded we need nothing more than the panel of very distinguished professors and the splendid presentations by both the majority council and the minority council. We asked them questions. The Republicans asked them questions. We heard their answers. We're ready to vote. We're ready to try this case in the high court of impeachment. What was being said in the sounds of silence was this. We don't have time to follow the rules. We won't even allow the House Judiciary minority members who have been besieging us time and again, to have their day, just one day, to call their witnesses. Oh yes, that is expressly provided for in the rules. We'll break those rules. That's not liberty and justice for all. The great political scientist of yesteryear, Richard Neustadt of Columbia, observed that the power of the president is ultimately the power to persuade. Oh yes, the commander in chief, And yes, charged with the conduct and authority to guide the nation's foreign relations. But ultimately, it's the power to persuade. I suggest to you that so too, the House's sole power to impeach is likewise ultimately a power to persuade over in the House. A question to be asked. In the fast track impeachment process in the House of Representatives, the House majority persuade the American people, not just partisans. Rather, did the House's case win over the overwhelming majority of consensus of the American people? The question fairly to be asked. Will I cast my vote to convict and remove the President of the United States when not a single member of the President's party, the party of Lincoln, was persuaded at any time in the process? In contrast, and when I was here last week, I noted for the record of these proceedings that in the Nixon impeachment, the House vote to authorize the impeachment inquiry was 410 to 4 in the Clinton impeachment. Divisive, controversial, 31 Democrats voted in favor of the impeachment inquiry. Here, of course, and in sharp contrast, the answer is none. It is said that we live in highly and perhaps hopelessly partisan times. It is said that no one is open to persuasion anymore. They're getting their news entirely from their favorite media platform. And that platform of choice is fatally deterministic. Well, at least the decision of decision makers under oath who are bound by sacred duty, by oath or affirmation to do impartial justice leaves the platforms out. Those modern day intermediaries and shapers of thought, of expression, of opinion are outside these walls where you serve. Finally, does what is before this court, very energetically described by the able house managers, but fairly viewed, rise to the level of a high crime or a misdemeanor? One so grave and so serious to bring about the profound disruption of the Article II branch, the disruption of the government, and to tell the American people, and yes, I will say, this is the way it would be read, your vote in the last election is hereby declared null and void. And by the way, we're not going to allow you, the American people, to sit in judgment on this president and his record in November. That is neither freedom nor is it justice. It's certainly not consistent with the most basic freedom of we, the people, the freedom to vote.